Welcome to Close Wars, the podcast that really did carry a bin, like a plastic tub of broken aughts and early 2010s fast fashion jewelry back and forth across the country, like at least three times, if not four times. I just didn't know what to do with it. And you'll you'll hear about that in today's episode. I'm sure you also have some fast fashion jewelry that is gross and discolored and not very useful that you don't know what to do with. <laughs> uh, so maybe, maybe this will really resonate with you. Anyway, I'm your host, Amanda, and this is episode 191. We're getting so close to 200. It's wild to me. This week's guest is Emily of jewelry and accessories brand MLE. We're going to be talking about all things accessories, including the drawbacks of so-called fast jewelry, the challenges of running an ethical and sustainable accessories brand, and the rampant copying and knockoffs in the accessories world, and so much more in between. You know, I'm going to be really honest with all of you, since the email, I've had a lot of anxiety about releasing an episode with a small business owner as a guest, and really for like no particular reason. (laughs) It's just in my head. And actually, this conversation with Emily will really underscore the challenges that small businesses face in a world where large businesses always have an unfair advantage and continue to gobble up and destroy small businesses, particularly ethical small businesses. And furthermore, I maintain that ethical small businesses are the future. That's the key word there, right? Ethical. You know, I had a conversation last week with a friend who was going to be a guest on an upcoming episode. And we talked about, which I don't want to like say it all right now, because I'm hoping she will say this when we record, but We talked about how we feel like we have all of these choices about where we can get the things that we need and want. And the reality is there are a few really big companies (laughs) masquerading as a lot of little companies, right? I mean, you know, one big example is banks, right? It seems like there's all these banks, but really there's like five companies now that are controlling the banking industry. And it's the same with retail and, you know, medicine and childcare and so many other aspects of our life. It's like this illusion of choice. And that illusion allows companies to price gouge us, right? It allows shrinkflation. It allows grocery prices to be out of control. It allows all these companies to sell us shoddy product that doesn't last and isn't repairable because we feel like we don't have any other options, right? Like the illusion of choice is maybe not even that successful because we kind of know we don't have a lot of choice. And that's one more reason to me that it's really important to protect small businesses because they they don't get away with the shenanigans. They can't afford to get away with the shenanigans of these big companies. Anyway, I know I talked about all of this in the email episode. Go back and listen to that. If you haven't yet, I don't need to beat a dead horse. I mean, this is clothes horse. We're only about living horses here. Anyway, I have had a lot swirling around in my head since the email episode and really long before the email episode. It's kind of funny always how a lot of different things I have been thinking about will sort of merge with something that happens IRL and help me see a bigger picture. As I've been saying, community and building more community within the slow fashion movement is a priority for me. I was thinking about that a lot last year as I felt very lonely and isolated in Austin. It was on my mind even more after the whole thing with Remake. And to be honest, I would not have made it through the remake thing and continued to work on Close Horse or as the CEO of Remake kept calling it in a disastrous Zoom meeting, uh, Clothing Horse. Um, I wouldn't have continued to do any of this work and I just would have dipped out completely after the way Remake handled it and just all of that, how the whole thing made me feel. If it hadn't been for the tremendous support of this community, 
I've always felt motivated and inspired by all of you, but at that moment, you also gave me strength and confidence that I would not have had otherwise. And that's the thing, like community is really magical like that. I'm not even sure if I really believe in anything magical outside of humans and community and our ability to make things happen when we work together. I think that's the only magic I actually believe in, even though I have been known to talk about astrology. (laughs) I've also had a lot of conversations over the past few months with various friends and members of our community that have reminded me that we've all become kind of disconnected over the past few years. Like, In 2020 and 2021, we were all in constant contact, talking about our lives, our work, our dreams, our fears. And we were really inspiring and supporting one another the whole time. For me, that time period was transformative. And I also recognize that we were able to do that because we had the time, right? The time is the thing that we never get to have. It's like the ultimate luxury. And you got to ask yourself, why don't we ever have the time to be close to one another, right? Why? Why is time such a luxury? In 2022, we were forced to pretend that life was normal again. And that's with the heaviest, most ironic air quotes, right? We were supposed to pretend that the pandemic was over, that we would go back to the before times of 2019, but you and I both know that it will never be the before times again. So much happened and continues to happen that pushes us forward and into different places, into different ideas, into different situations that we never imagined before. I mean, Think about all the things that happened in the world from 2020 to 2022. Think about all the things that happened in your personal life over those years. Think about how much all of us were changed by those years and how much we all grew on a personal level. It could never be the before times again. And you know what? That's a good thing. I think this abrupt quasi end to the pandemic, this forced pretending that it was 2019 again, it pulled us apart as we tried to adapt. And we no longer had time, time, that that luxury that we were, oh, we were rich with time in 2020 and 2021, right? That went away. It was a shock for me, all the change all at once. It was a shock for me when it all happened in 2020, and it was all a shock for me as that time period where, like I said, was transformative for me as it came to an end. And I'll tell you, when I'm dealing with a lot of stress and anxiety, this shock, this discomfort of change, I kind of turn inward. I don't reach out to others. I don't go places. I just hang out at home with Dustin and the cats, and that's, that's all I can do to keep going. I think that many of us found ourselves doing the same thing, especially since we didn't have a lot of time to do anything else. And as a result, our community felt more distant. It didn't help that even Instagram, which, I mean, it seems, it's almost embarrassing to say it out loud, but Instagram was a hub for all of us during that time period. And we all connected and got to know one another that way. And I guess, I mean, it is called social media, right? There was supposed to be socialization involved and we really made it happen then. Not so much right now, right? You know, something else that struck me over these past few months as I've been thinking a lot about now and comparing it to that 2020, 2021 period It's how back then we were sort of protecting one another from trolls and general shittiness on the internet. And when we encountered it, we could commiserate about it and give each other that pep talk that we needed and keep going. Because to be clear, trolls are always trolling. 
particularly when it comes to conversations about slow fashion and sustainability, etc. You never know when someone will decide to go scorched earth with you, someone, a total stranger over Amazon or Shein or vegan leather. <laughs> and while yes, I, I deal with my share of this, I actually see it happening even more often to the small business owners in our community who do a lot, and I mean a lot, of the unpaid labor of educating others about the ethical and environmental implications of the fast fashion industry. Like so much work. Which is funny, not in a ha-ha way, but more like an enraging way. Because millions of people will take a greenwashing campaign by like Nike or Free People or Zara And literally shower it with clapping hands emojis and declarations of, this is why you are my favorite brand, without one single question. Earlier this week, I was working on a post in support of the Fashion Act, which I think you all know by now I'm an ambassador for that campaign to get that law passed in New York State. And I was working on a post about Nike because Nike has, not only has it not signed on to support the Fashion Act, it has just like not even been responding to communication from the Fashion Act team. And it's ironic because, you know, Nike's always making all this content about how sustainability is so important to them. Now, I I see it, frankly, like being, being very transparent with you, it I see it all as greenwashing. I don't have a lot of faith in Nike. But in order to create that post, kind of calling them out for their hypocrisy and asking them to sign on to the Fashion Act, I had to watch a lot of videos that Nike makes. Like Nike makes so many videos. They spend so much money and time making videos about how important sustainability is to them. And they're all bullshit, right? Right. I mean, I can say that to all of you because you know that. And the comments section on these YouTube videos, I was like, first off, who is watching these videos? Because they are not interesting. But there they are, the comment sections, people showing up to be like, this is why I'm obsessed with Nike. This is why I love Nike. Nike, you're the goat, that kind of stuff. Just people loving Nike, right, without question, which... I mean, I've talked about here on the podcast before and certainly on social media. It always blows my mind the trust people have for Nike because for many of us who are active in the slow fashion movement right now, one of our first sort of brushes with the ethical implications of the fashion industry were with Nike in the 90s. And all of the stuff that came out about sweatshops and child labor and so much more. Like, to me, Nike is the OG of human exploitation and greenwashing. But people people love Nike. They don't question it, right? It's often voted the most trusted brand. And like I said, there are all of these YouTube videos about their sustainability and people love it. They don't question it at all. And you know, the same goes for like Free People or Zara or H&M or all these other companies. People will just trust these companies that frankly do not deserve our trust. But if a small business is trying hard to do things ethically and pay themselves a living wage, well, people have to show up to question the prices or the products or the ethics of that often one person small business. Like the bar is so much higher for these small businesses than it will ever be for Nike or Madewell or whatever. And these are the companies that actually have the resources to do things the right way in a much easier way than these small businesses are trying to make it work. These are the businesses, like even if just Nike was like, we're gonna get it together, we're gonna do things right. Nike is so massive that if they started doing that, it would have this huge impact on how the entire industry operates. It would be a game changer for the world, right? But no one asks them to do that, right? But someone will show up in the comments of like some resellers, 
Instagram, you know, a reseller who has like 3,000 Instagram followers and probably isn't even paying themselves a living wage to give them shit about like, you know, stealing from poor people or whatever. It. I guess I'm just venting here, but I know for many of you, you'll be like, yeah, I feel that. <laughs> Here's the thing that even when these small businesses do the work of showing the math, of showing their values, of showing the proof that they are in fact ethical and decent people, that doesn't even translate into sales that allow them to support themselves, right? It's not because people aren't shopping, because they are. They are just opting to give their money to Amazon or Nordstrom or Nike or whatever. And as we discussed in the email episode, we all need to buy a lot less stuff. And we need to start doing that right now. I mean, we need to start doing that like 10 years ago, but we definitely need to stop procrastinating and do it right now. But even if we buy half as much stuff, there's still plenty of money flowing through the system to support small businesses. Where it goes wrong is when we cut our spending in half and then keep shopping at Amazon. Like what? No, don't do that. What happens then is that more people are pushed to get jobs working for Amazon as other options dry up and what it is to work becomes even worse. Anyway, that's not what this episode is about, but you know, just was saying that. Last week or so, I think it was last week, Danny of Picnicwear, friend of the pod, obviously, sent out an email about a sale, just like any other business would. And someone, <laughs> this is like some next level trolling, I'll just tell you. Someone replied to the email, um, which once again, like who replies to those emails? Amazing. Um, they replied to the email with the, with the statement, when you finally realize all of your merchandise is grossly overpriced. Yeah. The whole thing was super weird and you can see more about it on the Picnicware Instagram. But the email sender had just subscribed to the mailing list six days earlier. <laughs> it was all kind of weird. And I'm sure just she was having a bad day and needed a way to kind of get it out and why not respond to an email from a stranger and maybe you'll get to feel a little bit better. Obviously, that's where trolling goes awry because it actually creates more bad feelings than existed in the first place. So no, that's not a good tactic for dealing with your emotions. Might I suggest going for a walk or snuggling your pet or listening to some music or making yourself something delicious to eat or dancing in your kitchen. There are many other ways to feel better after a bad day than uh, emailing someone random and being mean. The whole email response led to Danny doing an entire reel showing how the math maths for her business. And spoiler, the math totally maths. And I couldn't help but wonder why Danny and so many other small businesses, I see this happening constantly, why they all have to do this. But, you know, Zara or Urban Outfitters or Shein, they don't have to do that. And people are fine with continuing to shop those brands. I want to be clear that the math most definitely does not math for any of those companies without a whole bunch of human exploitation and tax loopholes. So not even like participating, giving back and supporting the communities that they exist within, right? Here's the thing, y'all, and I'm, I'm using the collective y'all here, meaning like the entire population of the internet as y'all. Feels very gender inclusive, right? Y'all know that Danny's math will math, as will any other small brand out there. Now, yeah, we've we've been down this road before. Sure, there are bad small businesses out there. There are bad doctors. There are bad teachers. There are bad race car drivers and musicians and, you know, librarians. But there are also, most people are pretty great, you know? And so, yeah, there are bad small businesses out there. But, you know, most of them are pretty good, right? Anyway, y'all know that stuff's not grossly overpriced unless you're talking about like the like $98 dress from a big retailer that only costs them $10 to make. Yeah, that's 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 when the math it doesn't math, when it's overpriced, when you're being ripped off as a customer. It's probably not when you're buying a sweater from Danny. 
Y'all also know that responding to an email sent from a small business where most likely there is one employee and that employee is the owner and they are both sending and answering the damn emails. Y'all know that it is a shitty and hurtful thing to send that kind of response. And you know what? It's not going to result in anything good happening, including you feeling better, right? Once again, when I say you, y'all, I'm not saying you specifically. I'm saying All of us, the internet, the users of the internet, these are all things that we need to recognize and say aloud and tell our friends and our family, like, hey, it's not really working, right? So we all know these things. Why would we make these kinds of comments or send trolly emails? Like, why? Well, I'm going to tell you why. Because we are all struggling. We're struggling financially, emotionally, physically, you name it. It is a really hard time to exist. And we we are lonelier than ever. I will concede that perhaps all generations of all people who have lived on Earth ever have felt that they were living during a really hard time to exist, right? At least, you know, like, I don't know. If I cut myself with a rusty knife, I can go get healthcare for it and won't die with like, you know, of tetanus and lockjaw, right? Like we traded off some hard things for some new hard things. But what I will not concede, because I know is in fact true, is that we do live in the loneliest time in history. In fact, there's an entire loneliness economy based on our yearning for human contact and connection. And businesses are trying to figure out how to turn our loneliness into lucrative money-making industries. And some are actually succeeding already. We've got social media platforms and dating apps, porn platforms, and all the other services and apps related to that. AI chat buddies and girlfriends, online gambling and gaming. These are all things that make money off of our loneliness, off of our isolation. I can't even begin to imagine what will be invented next to make us feel less lonely as technology grows, you know? But I also know that we overconsume all kinds of things in pursuit of of an escape from loneliness. I can't help but even think that like a Sheehan Hall video is a way to connect with others after the lonely experience of shopping online. We've talked here on the pod in the past about how for a long time in the pre-shopping online days, shopping IRL was a social activity, right? Where you would spend time with people and maybe also go out to lunch and you know, talk and make jokes and at the same time be buying things, right? Online shopping took that part of it away where you just you just buy things. So if you want the social element of shopping, well, what better than to show people online what you bought, right? I see our loneliness as an underlying theme and anti-reseller pylons in the comments of a TikTok or in subreddits and Facebook groups for specific brands. I see it in Stanley Thermos hoarding. I guess it's not a thermos. It's a Tumblr, whatever. The, the desire to collect these items and then connect about it online, that's all driven by loneliness. And it makes so much money. People are looking for connection right now. But unfortunately, it often arrives in the form of consumerism. I'm going to talk more about why that happens, but it's kind of like we're living in a world right now that is engineered to keep us lonely and keep us shopping as like a remedy for it. I'm going to share, I'm going to share a lot of different pieces in the show notes today that I would love for you to read or not, but uh, they're all things I read over the past few months as I was thinking a lot about the link between capitalism, consumerism, and loneliness. One of them is a short medium piece by Piyush Patel called The Loneliness Economy, How Capitalism Thrives on Isolation. He writes, 
The loneliness economy is a dark manifestation of modern capitalism, where corporations profit off of people's yearning for genuine human connections. In this dystopian landscape, shallow interactions, virtual validation, and superficial relationships dominate, leaving individuals disconnected, emptier, and lonelier than ever before. It is essential for society to recognize the detrimental effects of this economy and seek ways to prioritize meaningful human connections to combat the loneliness epidemic. And specifically, Patel's piece is more about how tech companies are making money off of loneliness, like the dopamine hits of online dating um, and of likes and shares and comments on social media and how AI is stepping in to start to create creating fake friends for us. But as I've said, I also see this loneliness reflected in our shopping habits, right? The number, I mean, I, I've told you all, like I'm a creep on the internet. I love observing people And one thing I do is I belong to a bunch of different Facebook groups for different fans of brands or aesthetics. And shopping is what brings these people together. I even belong to a Facebook group for people who love Aldi, the grocery store. And people people connect there and build relationships and get social interaction by talking about what they bought at Aldi. You know, it's like this quasi-community based on consumerism. The thing is, late stage capitalism, or whatever you want to call what we're experiencing right now, profits from our loneliness, while also exacerbating our loneliness. We're too busy working and trying to survive, even competing with one another for a tiny, tiny piece of the economic pie. We're so busy fighting to exist that we don't have time left to be with one another. Alexandra Kaufman is a student at Emory University, and she wrote a great piece for the Emory Wheel student newspaper last February called Capitalism Starves Us of Love. We don't have to stand by. And it has haunted me in a good way since the first time I read it. In fact, If you're only going to read one thing I have ever shared with you here on Clothes Horse, I would love for you to read this one. She writes, while love is nebulous, intrinsic, and necessary, capitalism is the opposite, conversely defined, external, and unnecessary. Characterized by the state's lack of interference in the economy, capitalism is a free market economy system that assumes humans are motivated by their own interests and operate in the world as self-serving individuals. Capitalism, as it manifests in American society, has spawned a unique set of circumstances for the working and lower class, in which self-reliant individuals are expected to work for profit-minded companies in order to survive, while becoming increasingly alienated from others and unable to focus on their relationships. Capitalism pushes us to focus on individual achievement and career advancement rather than personal connection. We are forced to busy ourselves with work to keep up with expenses and bills, leaving little time to bond with our loved ones. To put it plainly, while we are still capable of feeling love, the work culture that capitalism has created interferes with our ability to fulfill that love. It's infuriating to think that we spend so much of our time working, so much of our time commuting to work and getting ready for work and worrying about work that we often have very little time or emotional energy left for anything else, no matter where we work, what kind of job we have, or how much money we make. All of us are overworking, and often we are too exhausted to do more than watch TV or have a drink and to just go to bed, maybe doom scroll or do some online shopping while we watch TV and have a drink. There's nothing left for connecting with others. And so we become even more lonely, which most likely drives us to buy more stuff, to watch more TV, to have more drinks, which leads to debt, which leads us to work more, which makes us more lonely, which leads to more shopping and drinking and so on and so on and so on. Like we 
We are not living in a world right now that gives us the time to be with one another. And it, I don't, I don't think that like our economic systems, like capitalism as a whole was designed with that in mind. Right. I don't think that people thought that far ahead, but unfortunately that's what's happening is like, we're in this machine that where we have to work to survive and then we don't have time to, you know, to spend with other people. And so then we're lonely and then we spend more money and then we have to work more and it just keeps going. How do we change that? Right. Because I've been in it myself. I'll be honest with all of you. I was so lonely while we were in Austin, but in many ways, that was not a new feeling for me because I have always been working so much. And I had been feeling pretty lonely since we left Portland in 2018, because that's where my friends were. That's where I could spontaneously go meet someone for happy hour or go for a walk or run into someone. I didn't have that when we moved to Philadelphia. I didn't make friends there because I was working all the time. And then the pandemic began and then we moved to Austin and then I worked all the time and then I was lonelier than ever. And yes, I would often think back to 2020 and 2021, where yes, it felt as if the world was collapsing, but I also never felt lonely thanks to the large community of friends I had made through Close Horse. Because I had time for the first time in my adult life to build and maintain those friendships. That kind of went away for all of us in 2022, right? I think for many of us, That year and a half there where the world felt like it kind of stopped, although it didn't stop and many of us still worked a lot, but there were less options of things to do, I guess. I don't know. Suddenly we had more time to be with one another. And for many of us, that was the first time that had ever happened. It's ironic to me in a time when we couldn't actually physically be with one another because, you know, we didn't want to get sick or kill someone else by getting them sick. In this time when we had to physically keep our distance, many of us became closer than ever and built new relationships during that time period. And the secret was that we had time. I'm going to share another piece with you in the show notes. It was written in 2022 by Robert Newworth for a publication called Noema. It's called Capitalism Subverts Community. This one is a lot more economics focused, so I think Stacy of Rainbow Vintage will really love this one. The rest of you might not, but it talks about how there are sort of two types of economics happening concurrently all over the world. There is the top-up economics, the version that governments and economists alike are observing and discussing, and it's the standard version of the economy that we know, you know, growth year over year and widening wealth disparity, competition that maybe really isn't that competitive anymore now that, you know, there aren't that many different companies really left. About this top-up economics, Neuwirth says, the top-up economic sphere functions like a gated community in which people who have money can pretend that everything they do and have in life is based on merit, and that the communal and cooperative boosts from which they profit are nothing but natural outgrowths of that merit. Basically, like, the people who have, who have the money, who have the luxury probably of even spending time with other people, um, they they live in this top-up economy, right? The second form of economics happening in the world right now is the bottom down, as New Earth calls it. And this is all about working together to solve problems. It's thinking of the greater good. It's mutual aid. And it's just generally humans being humans together. This is the version of the economy that the vast majority of the population experiences, or I should say could experience, if we recognized the foolishness of the predominant narrative created by late-stage capitalism, namely that idea of merit and pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. Too many of us believe the bootstrap myth. Too many of us think that if we, we can be a one percenter, that we can be billionaires. The reason that people worship billionaires is because they think it can happen to them too. Guess what? It can't. 
all of us are part of this bottoms down economy and we have we have so much opportunity to make the world better when we recognize that and start working together. New Earth writes, change always comes from below and it is in the bottom down relationships where growth and egalitarianism can flourish. Every volunteer fire department is a community platform. Every mutually managed water system demonstrates that neighbors can build things when they need each other. Every community-based childcare network or parent-teacher association is a nascent collective. Every civic association, neighborhood or church council, social action network or food pantry gives people a broader perspective. Every collectively run savings and credit association demonstrates that communal trust can give people a leg up. It is through these self-governing institutions, which people join with their hearts as well as their heads, that we can hope to impact our system's most intractable problems. Here's the thing. We don't get to work together to fix these problems if we don't take a step back to realize who our community really is. It's not Sheehan, it's not Jeff Bezos, it's not Elon Musk. It's none of the big brands that we buy shit from, right? It's probably not our employers. It's not Dolls Kill, you know? It's not Facebook. These, those are not our community, okay? Our community is us. When we send trolly emails to small businesses or defend Sheehan in the comments section or go after secondhand resellers, we're actually distancing ourselves from our actual community and we're holding back process. All y'all who dream about degrowth and turning capitalism upside down, here's the thing. It doesn't happen when we're saying, well, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism anyway, and then we're ordering a new outfit from Shein or getting K-cups from Amazon, right? No, <laughs> that is not how we change the system within, that we live within right now. We change it by working together, by leaning into our community and caring for one another. I've said for a long time that slow fashion and really the slow everything movement is an issue of class solidarity. Do you stand with big corporations who underpay and exploit other humans all while, you know, polluting the planet where we all need to live? Or do you stand with the workers, the humans, the people trying their hardest to do better? Would you prioritize having a steady stream of cute, trendy clothes over human lives? Is it actually helpful to pile on resellers online? What progress comes from fighting amongst ourselves? Absolutely none. I'm going to tell you, the resellers are your people. The small business owners are your people. The people working really hard to share information and talk about larger social issues, they're your people. The thing is, as I've been talking about over and over again for the past few minutes, is that the system we live within right now, uh, it doesn't make it easy to connect with our people, to be a part of our communities, to make things happen within our communities. And that means that we have, well, we have to make a concerted effort, at least right now, to be a part of our community, to be connected to our people, to support our people and our communities. And, you know, theoretically, long term, it will be easier to be an active member of our communities, right? If we can really make the kinds of systemic changes that give us time back because they change, the work we do changes what it means to work within our society, to exist within our society, what day-to-day life is like. We're not there right now, right? Like right now, we got to make the effort. But if we don't make the effort, 
then nothing ever changes. So I also ask you, are you ready? Are you ready to get uncomfortable? <laughs> Which I am, I am doing myself. Are you ready to get uncomfortable and take the time to connect with your communities? There's a feeling that I have been feeling with more increasing and frightening intensity year after year after year. And it's, I feel like if I say it out loud, it becomes realer. So I was very hesitant to even talk about this, but I've been thinking about it so much lately that I want to tell you about it. And I don't like feeling this way because it robs me of my hope of my strength, of my commitment to fighting for what is right. And that is the feeling that I cannot stop the bad things happening in this world, that I am powerless to make things better, that nothing I do will ever change it, right? I bet you all are like, yep, that's how I feel too. It's like, no matter how many times I call my senator, I cannot stop the senseless suffering happening in Gaza and the Congo right now. The, I, can't, I can't free the Uyghur Muslims in China, no matter how much I talk about it or try to talk to others about it. I can't stop the suffering of animals and humans all over this planet. I can't slow the terror that is climate change. I can't stop people from shooting innocent humans or hurting others. I know that many of you feel that way too. The thing is, I can't let myself surrender to that feeling of hopelessness because it is that hope that keeps us going. And when we lose it, nothing happens. Things just get worse when we stop hoping, when we lose our passion for doing better. The truth is, I can't change the world on my own, but I can change it when I'm working alongside an entire community of people. When I reach outside of the exhaustion and the fear that has kept me isolated and lonely, when I reach out to all of you, change does come from below, and we are the below. But that change, it won't happen without community, without building this community and being an active part of it. In a 2019 piece for Salon called Capitalism Has Warped Our Understanding of Community and It's Making Us Vulnerable to Manipulation, Valerie Panda Pane writes, community is not a destination nor a goal. It's a way of being in the world, found where you are at in the real world with people most likely very different from you. It's something that cannot be purchased. If you see that, if you live in that, you'll never be alone and you'll always be a part of something bigger than yourself. And I want to say again, this piece is from 2019, the before times. Many people since 2020 have written about how lonely we are, how capitalism is a big part of it. I think, I mean, I don't think, I know we've all been having a reckoning over the past few years about how work and capitalism and hustle culture and this normalization of overworking, how it has made us lonely, right? How it is bad for us, both our physical and our mental health, because that loneliness is bad for our bodies, right? We've been talking about that a lot over the past few years, but even before that, people were starting to recognize that we were slipping further and further away from one another, and we were trying to fill the void with stuff. We need community now more than ever because we are facing problems so huge that they will never be fixed without all of us. And to be honest, do we really want to wait around for our governments or Amazon to fix it for us? Because I think they've already proven that we can't count on that or even trust them to think of us. And when you really think about it, leaning into community and getting to know those around you, working alongside of them, 
Well, community is the most anti-capitalist thing around. Embracing your community is a revolutionary act. Now, I'm one person who myself is, you know, trying to survive in late stage capitalism, but I'm also committed to doing what I can to support and nurture this community. I'm trying to leverage social media to actually make it work as a community builder by keeping us in touch and starting conversations. And hopefully Instagram will, I don't know, I can force them to bend to my will. (laughs) That's the hard part. Um, And I'm also hoping to get out in the world and see you all IRL this year including via the still incredibly nebulous Close Horse IRL convention this summer. However, Dustin and I have been looking at some spaces here in Lancaster and we're starting to formulate an idea. Whatever happens will be in late summer, just as an FYI. I'm also trying this new virtual meetup situation. I mean, we got to try everything, right? So if you haven't heard about it already, the first Close Horse virtual webinar slash hangout session will be happening on February 29th, aka Leap Day. And in this session, I'll be talking with all of you about why, you know, something we've been talking about for the past month, why new clothes are kind of garbage these days. I'll do a presentation of, of a lot of the things I've discussed in these episodes, and I'll take your questions. In fact, I'm hoping for a lot of audience participation because, you know, that's my favorite part. This session is free, but of course, I encourage all of you to buy me a Kofi afterwards for my work. If you have a good time, if you learn something, <laughs> otherwise, don't worry about it. Um, to register, you can follow the link in the show notes. And I'll be just real with you. I am too poor for the Zoom webinar level account, which allows you to have like a thousand attendees. So... This session is only open to 100 people, so it's first come, first serve, and I think there are, as I'm recording this, about 40 spots left right now. Um, Don't wait till the last minute. You still have time to get in there. Just go take care of it right now. Um, And this thing, you know, it might be an abject failure, and no one will show up, which is like a constant fear I have with anything ever, but if it's good, I want to keep doing it because I'm like, how can we... How can we build community in a world that makes it hard, right? Especially when we're all spread out all over the place. So that's just one thing I'm doing. I'm still thinking of more things. Maybe you'll have some ideas too. Um, but we we got to get serious about leaning into our community and helping it grow, you know, letting it flourish, letting ourselves be within it because it's the only way things are going to get better. We are not going to change things on our own. We need to do it together. Okay. That was a pretty epic intro to this episode. So let's jump into my conversation with Emily. All right, Emily, why don't you introduce yourself to everyone? Hi, everyone. My name is Emily LaMondry. I'm a women's accessories designer, and I'm based in upstate New York in Saugerties in the Catskills. Uh, My brand is called MLE, the letters M-L-E, which sounds just like my name, and it's actually my initials (laughs) backwards. What? Okay, I just got it that it was Emily, but that's also amazing that that's your initials backwards. Did your parents plan that? No, it just, I mean, it just kind of happened. I mean, when I started the line, I wanted to have, you know, like a a designer brand that had my name somehow involved in it, you know, like a mm-hmm. typical high-end fashion brand. And But I also wanted it to feel contemporary and modern. And I love the idea of it being initials. And that's how we, um, how I ended up with MLE. Wow. That worked out so well. Yeah. <laughs> So how did you end up with a career in fashion? Is this something you always wanted to do or did it happen to you? It sort of just happened. Um, That being (laughs) said, I come from, you know, a long line of creatives and, you know, family members that have worked in the fashion industry. My grandparents on my dad's side were tailors. My Armenian grandmother on my mom's side was a seamstress. She actually made samples uh, for Macy's and many other brands, you know, in the um, 70s and 80s. And I um, always have been creative. I have a background in fine arts and painting, and I always have liked making things. 
And as I got older, it shifted away from the visual arts into more, shall we say, commercial um, <laughs> avenue. And, and you know, it started actually with silkscreen t-shirts in college. I was an art history major undergrad at Johns Hopkins. Mm -hmm. I was graduating in uh, 2009 uh, during a recession. And Great time. During that time, I, <laughs> yeah, I know. It was um, the type of thing I was very concerned about, like, what what's going to happen to me next? What am I doing? Do I want to go to grad school? Do I want to, you know, get a full-time job? And nothing was really gelling with me. And I'd always been creative. I'd been able to support myself before that, you know, with other jobs I came up with over the summer and things like that when I was home from college. And I thought about, you know, painting t-shirts and even silkscreen t-shirts as a way to support myself. And actually that spring semester, senior year, um, we had an event on campus called Spring Fair and I sold out of my t-shirts like every day I had no. my, my booth. And that night I would be up all night printing more t-shirts. And I was like, maybe I'm onto something. <laughs> And then yeah. that first summer after graduating, I actually supported myself entirely off of selling t-shirts. You know, I felt like I was onto something and it was really exciting. But then what happened was the weather got cold and people weren't <laughs> buying t-shirts as much as Boo. they were when, <laughs> in, in the warmer weather months. And, you know, there was an opportunity at that time. Uh, Baltimore, uh, where I went to college, had an amazing thrifting scene. And I started buying clothing that I was finding in thrift stores, reworking them, and silk screening on them. And that became like the next, I guess, evolution of my brand. So we started with silk screen t-shirts, moved into vintage clothing that I would alter and silk screen. And it was a sustainable way, you know, to create fashionable pieces or pieces that were interesting, but still unique. And then what happened with that was during this time, I'd been out of school for about a year and or so. And, um, I decided to apply for an MBA program at NYU Stern. That was part-time. I like the idea of a part-time program, so I'd be able to mm -hmm. still work on my company, but then also apply, you know, the learnings from the course uh, to whatever I was doing. And I was accepted. And with that, I moved to New York. My whole perspective about what a fashion company was or what I could have completely changed. You know, I was in the capital, mm -hmm. the world capital of fashion and just being exposed by so many other brands and what I was learning in grad school really changed everything for me. And it was that time um, that it, it morphed from, you know, t-shirt company to vintage clothing that I was silk screening on to it became a full-on contemporary women's line that I was designing prints myself. I was having the prints produced on fabric. I was doing the pattern making. I was taking class at FIT part-time and learning how to do that as well, making the samples. And then I started getting wholesale orders from Urban Outfitters, which was, you know, when I started this line, that was my goal. And within, I'd say, two years or a year and a half of moving to the New York City, it happened. And that was a big turning point for me. I mean, that's incredible. That's like the dream. Yeah. I mean, it was the dream at first, I'll say that. <laughs> but <laughs> fair. You know, I had a lot, Very fair. <laughs> I had a lot going on at that time. So I, I was... Um, I was getting my MBA part-time. I was actually working full-time during the day as a print designer for a women's company to be able to fund my fashion company. And then I was also doing my fashion company, you know, proceedings or running that company, basically, in whatever time existed besides that. And it was a lot. I mean, something that came out of it, you know, the first order I got from Urban Outfitters, it was an $11,000 order, which I'd never seen that much money ever in my life in one time. <laughs> and But the way the way that order came in and the way a lot of wholesale, um, I guess, wholesale retailers operate is it was a net 60 order. So, and that Ooh. was an order they placed, I believed, in July for shipping in November and I had to figure out how to fund that order myself. So to do the production at that time, you know, to find the funds. That's why I got that job to be able to fund the production of that first run. And then it just became, you know, in a way a slippery slope because as soon as I shipped that order, waiting 60 days to get paid, then it was, okay, they want to place another order, but where's that money coming from? The orders are getting bigger and bigger. I mean, I will tell you that like all of my friends who – have smaller brands like this is this they still face this struggle that often when you know you sell to a bigger account like urban outfitters they're going to give you mm -hmm. those net 60 terms and you really can't negotiate them because you're sort of like the power imbalance is there right you're not going to push back and be like actually i need net 15 or something like there yeah. you don't feel like you can do that and so many of my friends who have brands that are selling to like larger retailers like this or even selling on fair they're in this constant like 
I don't know, like anxiety about money because the money is going to come, but it's going to come like four months, five months after they pay for the production. And I mean, Mm -hmm. that's just not reasonable for a small business. That's like a really, really dangerous place to be. It's really scary. And I have noticed that more and more like uh, different services are popping up to sort of give brands, I don't know, like what I I think of as like payday loans, you know, to cover Mm -hmm. the production that they're going to have to pay back then. And in some regards, like the terms are pretty reasonable, like Shopify, for example, does this. But I am always like waiting for the other shoe to drop with anything that involves money. Like when's this going to become like really, I don't know, predatory where suddenly the interest rates are going to get really high or the terms are going to be out of control. So I think that this is like, this is the thing that stands in the way of the growth of so many small businesses or even the ability for the designers, the owners to pay themselves. And for me, like as as I've moved up the ladder in buying, I'm obviously not a buyer anymore, but as I made that progression and got to the leadership level where I actually sometimes could make decisions, (laughs) you know, Uh, Mm -hmm. I would often negotiate a deposit model with small brands where I'd be like, okay, we're going to give you 50% of the cost of the order up front upon issuing the order so that you can pay for production because it's not fair for you to go into debt to sell stuff to us, you know? Yeah. And uh, I... I I haven't, I don't think I've ever told this story on the podcast before, but back when I worked at Nasty Gal, we placed an order, I mean, I specifically placed an order for these jackets from a brand that is very, now very well known um, in the sort of like made in the USA slow fashion space. They're based in LA and they had just made the shift from, they mostly sold pins and patches, but they started making these jackets and I placed an order for just like a small amount. They sold out right away. So we placed another order for a lot more and those sold out. And then we placed an even bigger order, but we weren't giving this person a deposit on any of this stuff or any sort of good payment terms. And after we placed that huge order, I got laid off about a month later or a little bit longer later, like Nasty Gal officially declared bankruptcy. In that time period, they received this huge order, which I can't even imagine This was like a one-person company at that point. The amount of money that they put out for this production. And this was, once again, Mm -hmm. a person who had been primarily making pins and patches. Now they make only apparel and they make a lot of it. But they shipped the order. And then it was like, oh, guess what? Well, you're going to get – you're not going to get paid now because we declared bankruptcy. You're going to get some sort of settlement of pennies for a dollar – on the dollar – And that the owner of that brand was really transparent about it on social media, which I'm really proud of them for doing that. That was basically like, we're probably going to go bankrupt over this. This is probably the end of my business. And what she actually did then was start a Kickstarter program to start manufacturing more apparel and to cover that expense. And that was what really got the brand going. Um, But that's like a really rare situation where it works out that well. I think that it surprises a lot of people to hear that designers, small brands, they often work full-time jobs too, just to fund the business. That's like almost everyone I know. Yeah. And I think also part of this that a lot of people don't realize is in terms of the production, as a designer, you have to pay all your suppliers up front. It's not like Mm -hmm. they're waiting to get paid for you to get paid from the wholesaler for them to get paid. No, you have to pay your production up front. You have to pay your team up front. So you're operating at a loss and then waiting to get paid, you know, after it shifts, after you don't even have the goods anymore. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's so long. Like, cause some some retailers are like, okay, we will the net sixty terms, which means they have sixty days to pay you, begins after we've received the order. So mm-hmm. it's like, okay, then there's the shipping, and then it's got to get to the warehouse, and they have to like, if the warehouse is backed up, like if it's holiday season or something, there might be a few more weeks on top of that. I mean, it's a long time. It's got to feel endless when it's your money on the line. Yeah, I have nothing to add to that. (laughs) So you have this success, you make these jumpsuits for Urban Outfitters, which is a pretty big deal. Why did you stop making clothing? Yeah, so it was a combination of, you know, the orders are getting larger. I wasn't able to fund the order myself. But then also um, the wholesale orders I was getting, there was pressure 
to drive the cost down, which meant diluting the quality. And I had a certain quality level I wanted to maintain. So there were things such as my samples, I made them all in mm -hmm. silk. But in order to meet the price point that the wholesalers were looking for, we had to do it in polyester. Mm -hmm. Then I had some prints that, you know, we were matching the prints on the seams. And because of that, we were using extra fabric. And to get the cost down, that meant mismatching the print. So it became, you know, it just became diluting, diluting. And it, it was a very different quality than what it started with. But then also just besides all of that, um, the nature of having a clothing brand is that you run into fit issues and a really high return rate. And for me, that just wasn't sustainable. I didn't experience it personally for this brand, but it was something I was aware of. And it was also something I got exposure to when after deciding to take a break from this business after I felt burnt out and I basically needed to continue to support myself, but was still interested in fashion, I moved uh, into working in e-commerce and digital marketing for fashion brands. So there I really got firsthand experience into what was going on with the return rate. The average return rate for a clothing company for online is about 30%. Isn't that wild? Yeah, it is wild. Because <laughs> if you think about, you know, just the logistics of, you know, 30% of your inventory being returned to you, but then also having to repackage it, check it, and just, you know, the emissions being mm. generated from all that driving back and forth for the the carriers to do those returns, you know, it is it becomes it does become a sustainability issue. Um, so after working, you know, for about five years or so in e commerce, working for fashion brands, working uh, in terms of you know implementing digital marketing and e commerce ideas, that I saw these brands growing. I decided, you know, I I was becoming interested in starting something myself. But I was, again, but I wasn't quite sure what it wanted to be. And I was thinking a lot about sustainability, thinking about this high return rate, and I landed on accessories. And the reason I decided to move into accessories is because it's more seasonless. Um, so there's less of a need to come out with a big new collection every season, which mm -hmm. means less waste. And then that size fit issue that you experience with clothing, it's not as much of a concern. And that's something I've seen on my end personally with my accessories brand, Emma Lead, so that we have like a virtually 0% return rate, which is amazing. And besides that, also, you get more creative freedom. So when you say accessories, it could literally be anything. Yeah, I started my career in accessories and it was way more fun than working in apparel because you are so, well, especially if you have to meet really aggressive pricing targets. You're so reined in in apparel. And I felt like when I was at accessories, like if I could dream it, I could make it. And it was far more creatively fulfilling than clothing ever was. And that return rate, man, you cannot discount that. <laughs> it's such a big deal, you know, because that's the other thing, like, and I've been talking about that in previous episodes, you know, one of the reasons clothes are so garbagey right now is that return rate. Like 30% is pretty average. I read the most recent like quarterly financial stuff about Revolve, like their the transcript of their uh, financial call. And their return rate year to date for 2023 at that point was 60%. Six wow. out of 10 garments they sold got returned, which is like a nightmare. I don't know how they're still in business. And, you know, in most companies, when your return rate is that high, what happens is you're given larger margin targets to make the math math, which means the cost of everything you make has to be even lower, which means everything is getting diluted even more, you know, mm -hmm. whereas like in accessories, yes, we had like aggressive margin targets, but we didn't have to make up for all of these returns and other like fit issues. I mean, like I felt frequently in apparel, we would receive a whole order that we couldn't even sell because there was some egregious fit or quality issue that didn't happen as much in accessories. Um, not to be, there's plenty of horrible fast fashion accessories out there, but like just from like a working on it in the buying uh, product development side, it's so much more fun. So, uh, you know, one thing you make is jewelry, right? And when you and I were preparing for this episode, you used a term that I'm used to using for work as well, and that is costume jewelry. But what I've found is that most people don't know what that means. Um, so could you explain to everyone what costume jewelry is? Sure. So costume jewelry is jewelry that is not made with precious metals. So that that would be, for example, sterling silver, 14 karat gold, platinum. So it's jewelry that can look very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, or, 
or or mimic the look of you know fine jewelry, gold or silver. But uh, the focus is on the affordability. So with that means that it's being made with materials um, that are not gold and silver. So usually that means a base that is brass or zinc, and it's usually plated. So that being said, there's a whole range of um, quality in terms of costume jewelry. Another term for costume jewelry that we use in the industry is fashion. So fashion jewelry versus fine jewelry. And uh, something about the plating um, is like, for example, if you're looking at like a gold ring that is a costume jewelry ring, that probably um, has a base of brass and it has a plate layer on top of it that's uh, a gold tone, but it might not necessarily actually be 14 karat gold. It might just be some mix of metals that has uh, an effect to look gold. And there's many different also thicknesses of the plating. So that is a whole array, a whole range of quality right there just with the thickness because I've had jewelry personally, costume jewelry that, you know, you wear it once, you wash your hands with it and the plating comes off. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. And then related to that is a lot of times with costume jewelry, in order to have that plating layer stick, they use metals uh, to help reinforce that layer. So for example, nickel. Um, so nickel is a metal that's not not hypoallergenic. A lot of people are allergic to it, and it's actually illegal in uh, Europe to use nickel for costume jewelry. But in the U.S., it's very common actually to put nickel under uh, the plating layer to have a stronger bond to keep that semi-precious metal or even something that just looks like a gold uh, to the base metal. Interesting. Like how, what, do you know what the, the signs are that you might, one, be wearing something nickel and two, be allergic to it? Like is, do you get like inflammation or rash? Is that when your ear turns green? Yeah. So um, usually signs that you're allergic to whatever's going on with the costume jewelry is that it's itchy, it turns uh, red or pink, it's inflamed, it can puff up. Um, the turning, the green is what's, that's actually a result of the brass, the base layer yeah. being exposed. Um, so that can leave a, a mark or even a ring around like if on your finger, if you're wearing a ring that the, the base metal has been exposed. Um, that being said, at Emily, at our brand, we do make some pieces that are in theory considered costume jewelry, but we take the extra precaution to make sure that the quality is there. So for example, for the plating, we work with a plater in Rhode Island to do a very thick layer of plating and we use genuine 14 karat gold or platinum. And we do wear testing and we make sure that all our pieces are hypoallergenic. So we're not using nickel in the plating. We're also making pieces out of stainless steel, which is hypoallergenic. So Again, there's a whole range here in terms of what costume jewelry can be, but it's very common with fashion brands to do costume jewelry because it's an affordability thing, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something that's come up a lot with with our pieces because we offer fine jewelry pieces that are solid 14 karat gold, but the price point, you know, something that's, you know, $600 to $900 is not necessarily accessible to someone. Um, and that's why the costume jewelry version comes out, a plated version. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, costume jewelry, obviously, like I've worked my whole career in the fast fashion realm. So I was exclusively working with costume jewelry. And it's interesting, Mm -hmm. like you said, there is a whole spectrum here. We're talking like, at the bottom level, like Claire's, right? Or like, the jewelry at Forever 21 that is somehow $2.90 for a necklace, you know, there's that at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Obviously, jewelry, you would be buying from Shein or Timu or Zara, really any fast fashion brand. And, you know, and then there's the higher end, well-plated, high quality stuff that is built to last. Uh, my experience is that those are, those styles are frequently coming from smaller brands like yours. Mm-hmm. And the other thing I'll just say is that in the world, I mean, it's, it's just like when we're talking about buying clothing, right? In the world of jewelry, it's really important to read and ask questions about the metal about like the plating, et cetera, because this is another area where people, by people I mean like companies, brands, are not necessarily pricing in a way that reflects the quality. Yes, we can say if we go to Claire's and we can get three of those earring cards of like 20 studs for like $5, Mm -hmm. yes, we we can say with certainty that these are not 
earrings that are built to last, that they we're not going to get a lot of use of them. They're not the best use of our money. They're going to be in the landfill, right? But I, I look at, you know, other brands like, say, Anthropology or, you know, like, and other stories and whatnot who are selling costume jewelry at a higher price point that would make you think that it is higher quality, but it is not necessarily. It's really important to read, like, the information about what this is made of. And if if it's not clear, uh, that's probably a red flag because certainly any brand is going to brag about using high quality materials to appeal to you, to get you to purchase. But you can also just reach out. I mean, we would, even when I was like at Urban Outfitters where our clear, our, I mean, our jewelry was vaguely nicer than what you would buy at Forever 21. At least It looked nicer in the store, but it wasn't necessarily higher quality. But people would reach out all the time and just say, hey, is this hypoallergenic? Is this this? Is this that? And I respect those people for doing that, even though we had to constantly say, "Um, no. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know, like, I think that these are really important things to think about. And I personally, I get this anxiety sometimes When I think about, I think about the specific time in my life, probably between like 2005 and 2010, when I was buying so much jewelry on sale at Urban Outfitters and at Forever 21, and it was the era of like statement necklaces and stuff, and how sometimes those necklaces wouldn't even last a few wears. Like you were saying, you'd get it wet and the plating would come off or it would turn black or the chains would just break or, you know, on and on and on. And... That makes me think, I think that we, you know, we talk about clothing a lot being this huge waste crisis, but crappy jewelry is a part of that too. (laughs) Yeah. So I think also part of it is, you know, a big thing with the jewelry industry is being able to recycle metals. Mm -hmm. When you don't know what the metals are, how can you possibly recycle them? (laughs) I mean, that was going to be my next question because I I kind of am pretty sure I know the answer here, which is like, you can't recycle like the jewelry that you buy at the mall because it's all like composite, right? Like it would be impo- – like putting it in your recycling bin is not going to is not gonna make it better. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And then you can't – you also can't melt it down because that's something that we do in the jewelry uh, industry is that scrap metal or even pieces that people don't want anymore. It's melted down and used to cast a new piece. But when you don't know what the metal is, when it's an amalgam of, you know, zinc and – um, nickel and all these other things, you can't melt that and reuse it. Yeah. So it's it's just garbage. Yes. Which brings me to my next question because it was something that, you know, as we talk about this a lot with clothing, like with the quality of clothing being so bad right now, um, like it's specifically, you know, for, like the ba- vast majority of brand new clothing that people are buying right now is so bad. I mean, all you need to do is go spend an afternoon at a thrift store and you will see it. It's scandalous. You know, the question we ask a lot is what will the vintage clothing of 20 to 30 years from now be? Because it seems like the clothing that people are buying right now is not going to be around then or be desirable. I mean, it'll be around. It'll be somewhere in a landfill, but it won't be around being worn in the same way that clothing from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and even 90s are. And so my question is like, what will the vintage jewelry of the future be? Since we know a lot of the low-end costume jewelry, which for sure companies are making and selling so much of this. Like I will tell you that when you go into your standard fast fashion store, the most profitable stuff in that store is the jewelry because they mark it up so much. I mean, we're talking like necklaces that are $2 that are selling for 20. It's a huge marked up markup, but we know the quality isn't there. Like what will the vintage jewelry of the future be? Like what will our generation hand down to our grandchildren? Yeah. I mean, it's a fair point. And I think, I think it's because we've been like in this idea of like more is more and we need lots of jewelry rather than like a few nice things that we just wear and feel good about. Well, I mean, something I'm struggling with because somewhat similarly as you, you know, when I was younger and that's all I could afford at the time, you know, I was buying fast fashion jewelry when I was a, you know, a a college student or right out of college. I was buying those Forever 21 pieces. And it's funny because now, you know, 
15 years later, I'm going through my jewelry collection and I see those pieces and they're all, you know, tarnished and they're not wearable. And I know that if I put them in my ear, my ear's going to get itchy from it. And I feel bad <laughs> yeah. throwing it out, but like, what am I supposed to do with it? <laughs> that's, you know, that's what it becomes. I know. Cause you can't recycle it. Yeah. 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 So, so then it's like, okay, because now also I feel very bad throwing things away because it goes in a landfill. It's not like it disappears. Like it disappears from you, from your, you know, immediate life, but it's basically in a landfill will never break down and it's forever. Yeah. It's really, I mean, I, I will tell you that there was this bin of like that fast fashion costume jewelry that I was just moving around from city to city as I moved because I didn't know what to do with it. I was like, all mm-hmm. a lot of this has turned black or green or white. It's all gross. Um, I don't know what to do with it. I know I can't recycle it. I have tried cleaning it and I can't. And yet I still haven't found out where it goes and what to do with it. And it, I was just like, man, if I would known then what I know now, I wouldn't have bought all this. And now it's like this burden. I mean, I think all the time, like – if we went to the Grand Canyon and it was full of fast fashion clothes, we would all be devastated and people would have this very visceral reason to change their consumption habits. But, you know, often like the reality of waste is sort of hidden from us. We just like put it in the trash bin and then we never have to see it unless we drive by a landfill or something really fast. And I think like having this burden of carrying around this jewelry was like really reminding me, like it stuck with me. I have barely purchased any jewelry since then because I'm just like, oh, it's too stressful. I only want, if I'm going to buy something, I want to buy something I'm going to wear the rest of my life, you know? Totally. I mean, I go through it with my, I remember when I was organizing my jewelry, just a jewelry box I was going through and I was like, wow, so much of my space I have allocated for my jewelry is costume jewelry from when I was a you know, younger and, you know, I, my favorite thing, which is like funny, it's like, you know, like the, all that crystal stuff, it's just all cloudy and you're looking at it and uh-huh. it's so sad. You're like, well, I can't, I can't bring the sparkle back to this. I can't make it clear again. <laughs> <It's> just- <laughs> <laughs> I will say like in 2020, 2021, when I was like home a lot, I finally started doing stuff with some of that random jewelry I'd been carrying around to mix results. And I even went to the thrift store and bought other costume jewelry and like broke it down for its beads and stuff and I made some really cool things but like I think I I hesitate to even speak out loud about that because I don't want people to think like oh I can just continue to buy a bunch of dumb stuff and I will later make something else out of it because like odds are high that you won't you know (laughs) like that was an exceptional time where I was just sitting at home every day and I could only play the sims for so long before I got Mm -hmm. burned I was like feeling resentful of my sims I needed to do something else (laughs) 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 let's take a moment to thank some of the incredible small businesses who keep close horse going via their generous patreon support selena sanders a social impact brand that specializes in upcycle clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels linens blankets and quilts Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon, with a focus on natural fibers, simple hardworking designs, and putting fat people first. Discover more at shiftwheeler.com. Late to the party, creating one-of-a-kind statement clothing from vintage, salvaged, and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room. All while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at late to the party people. Vino Vintage, based just outside of LA. We love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. 
Gabriela Antonis is a visual artist, an upcycler, and a fashion designer. But Gabriela Antonis is also a feminist micro business with radical ideals. She's the one woman band trying to help you understand why slow fashion is what the world needs. If you find yourself in New Orleans, Louisiana, you may buy her ready to wear upcycle garments in person at the store Slow Down at 2855 Magazine Street. Slowdown Nola only sells vintage and slow fashion from local designers, and Gabriella's garments are guaranteed to be in stock in person, but they also have a website so you may support this woman-owned and run business from wherever you are. If you're interested in Gabriella making a one-of-a-kind garment for you, DM her on Instagram at slowfashiongabriella to book a consultation. Please follow her on Instagram at slowfashiongabriella. That's Gabriella with one L. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at dylanpage.com and find us on Instagram at dylanpagelifeandstyle. Salt Hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand-blocked, sewn, and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at Salt Hats. Gentle Vibes Vintage. We are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage, creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at thumbprintdetroit. High Energy Vintage is a fun and funky vintage shop located in Somerville, Massachusetts, just a few minutes away from downtown Boston. They offer a highly curated selection of bright and colorful clothing and accessories from the 1940s to the 1990s for people of all genders. Husband and wife duo Wiley and Jessamy handpick each piece for quality and style with a focus on pieces that transcend trends and will find a home in your closet for many years to come. In addition to clothing, the shop also features a large selection of vintage vinyl and old school video games. Find them on Instagram at High Energy Vintage, online at HighEnergyVintage.com, and at markets in and around Boston. Vagabond Vintage DTLV is a vintage clothing, accessories, and decor reselling business based in downtown Las Vegas, Nevada. Not only do we sell in Las Vegas, but we're also located throughout resale markets in San Francisco, as well as at a curated boutique called Lux and Ivy located in Indianapolis, Indiana. Jessica, the founder and owner of Vagabond Vintage DTLV, recently opened the first IRL location located in the Arts District of downtown Las Vegas on August 5th. The shop has a strong emphasis on 60s and 70s garments, single stitch tees, and dreamy loungewear. Follow them on Instagram at Vagabond Vintage DTLV and keep an eye out for their website coming fall of 2022. You know, you've been running, I mean, I feel like you've been running a brand in one way or another, like since you reached adulthood, basically, right? What challenges do you face as a small business owner? I'm managing my my production and sampling, and that's a whole other can of worms that I haven't even talked about. Yeah, tell us about that. uh, Yeah, so in terms of, you know, doing production and sampling of accessories, it's very different from clothing because... 
Designing accessories relies a lot on components. And what I mean by components, like hardware, um, different aspects to have the accessories, you know, fit together. So for jewelry, it could be a clasp or even uh, an earring that, you know, the rest of the beads hang off. And it's very important when you're doing this kind of accessories work to think about, for me anyways, like what makes this piece unique? What makes this like fall under my brand? How does this stand out? How does this look like something mm-hmm. no one's seen before? And the and the issue with that is a lot of times it comes down to, I need to design something like a component, which means, you know, do I hire a CAD designer? Do I learn CAD? My husband and I actually recently bought a 3D printer. Whoa. And I mean, some of my designs already are, are based in CAD, but it's a lot of needing to develop something yourself and then having to do a production run of that component in order to then put it together with everything else to make it custom. If, does that make sense? When I talk to people who don't work within the industry and also work work with people who work within the industry but don't know the product development side of it, there seems to be a lot of confusion or, I don't know, misconception, I guess I'll say, that if you can imagine something, then China can make it for you or someone can make it for mm-hmm. you. And it's it's actually so much more complicated than that. That is 100% not true. Now, maybe if you work at Zara, right, and you're going to make 100,000 units of something and you have a specific clasp or component in mind, sure, yeah. they might be able to actually make that for you. They can create a mold and, and manufacture that. But like, if you're a small brand, you don't get to say, I want this very specific class, but that doesn't exist, but that I imagined. Like, it's not that simple. Um, mm-hmm. And Sometimes it will take so many samples back and forth to get things right, um, even if you are able to get the components that you want. But man, I had, I specifically, like when you were talking about that, it triggered a memory of like my worst (laughs) job ever. No, it's fine. Uh, The creative director there had no experience in fashion whatsoever or product development. She was under that misconception that if she had an idea, then I should be able to just go out and find someone with it like within a day. And it would often be like, I had this vision of like a button or a fabric print or a fabric Mm -hmm. type and like it would be tears from magazines or from blogs or whatever. And I'd be like, this is, you sent me a picture of like a specific clasp from like a Gucci bag. Like we, we can't get that, you know, (laughs) like, or like this like tapestry fabric. It's very beautiful, but like we would have to buy like a hundred thousand yards to to make that exist, even if we could, and and or like a very specific button. It was always something like that, and I was like, it's way more complicated than you think, especially when you don't have a lot of buying power, um, and it's also really hard to convey what your vision is to someone else. Do you know what I mean? Like it's mm-hmm. it's just not that simple. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that's why right now I'm spending the time learning CAD because, mm-hmm. you know, I've done sketches and sent it to a designer or a factory to then say, okay, can you do the sample for me and make the mold for me? And it comes out different than I expect. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I, I do want to have more control over that. And also I think it helps keep costs down by doing this kind of work on my own instead of relying on a factory or another designer to do it. Um, but then it means more work for me. You know, I do things like sometimes I'll carve things out of wax and then we'll cast that. And that's how we'll get our master. Master is what that means. It's like the the piece that you make the mold from. It's the the thing that before you do your production, it's the perfect specimen that already exists. You make your mold and then you use that for your production run. So we do that with our jewelry for our rings and our our earrings, our necklace clasps. Um, even for hair clips, you know, some of our clips involve having a 3D mold, injection mold, which, um, you know, our croissant claw clips, uh, that is a 3D mold that, that was very challenging to figure out with my factory. And I frankly don't see many other hair clips like that, that have that kind of a texture, but for me, it was important. You know, that's also something else when you're designing, you want to create something that your customer hasn't seen before, because Mm -hmm. that's what makes you unique from other brands and that what make, that's what makes you stand out but what ends up happening is you just keep innovating and challenging yourself and you know throwing it's almost like jumping through hoops it's like what other <laughs> <laughs> complicated things I figure out that I haven't seen before <laughs> yeah yeah but also like I will say like there is I also just appreciate the effort that, that you're putting into like learn these skills and create these these initial samples and molds because I think that you know if you haven't worked in the industry you don't know how wasteful 
the sample back and forth process can be. Mm. Like it can be, especially in accessories, so many tries until it's right. Three, four, five, six, seven. I mean, that's ostensibly what sample sales are for, to sell all that weird stuff. But we know a lot of that just goes to waste, you know? And it, it especially like early in my career, the first category I worked on, it was shoes, which was like, oh, wow. if you've ever, there's... There is nothing more disappointing than the first sample of a shoe development. <laughs> it is like always so bad. And you're like, oh, well, cool. So no one would ever want this shoe. At least you only made one. It's not a pair. But like, what are we going to do with this? It's going to be seven more samples until we get this shoe right. And so we're going to have all these seven single shoes that are just trash, you know? And I think like that would have been a really great time for my employer to invest in like a designer who could ca cad this stuff up for us, you know, or creating samples in house that could just be go into production, but rather, mm -hmm. no, we're just creating one sample after another, you know, shipping it via air from China over and over again, maybe India. Um, we're using all these resources to continue to not get this right. You know? <laughs> Um, it's like one of those things that you don't know about until you work in the industry and you see all these other ways in which it can be really wasteful, mostly because brands aren't spending the money to make it less wasteful. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm, I applaud you for, for learning all these different ways. <laughs> oh, thanks. Well, it's definitely, it's definitely a lot because that's, I mean, part of this is also, you know, as you're doing this, you're like, what's my next best seller going to be? Mm -hmm. And you have that pressure as you're going through this is like, I think this could be good, but will it be great? Will it go viral? <laughs> you don't know. Yeah. And that's just, you know, the design process. After you do the design process for me, at least with my brand, then I have to do the content creation. So we do a photo shoot. We work with a team on social media. My husband and I work very closely in terms of creating all the content together. We have a concept, you know, we shoot the content and then you know, we post on social and then it's like, okay, did it do well? Did it not do well? <laughs> <laughs> do we post at the right time? <laughs> oh, the time, man. I'm always like living on the edge and posting at the wrong time and then being mad at myself. Like I knew better, but I just didn't feel like waiting, you know? Yeah, it's a whole thing. I mean, it is like, you know, I always say that like small business owners, they actually probably have the most detailed and lengthy resume of anyone because you end up doing like the jobs of 10 different people. I mean, here you are, you're doing product development and content creation and social media and digital marketing. And like, there's also the logistics of it all, right? Like getting mm -hmm. stuff in, getting stuff out, you know, like, do you, do you and your husband fulfill all the orders or do you have a third party warehouse? Like, what do you do? So I have a small team. I'm very lucky to work with a small team, uh, in upstate in Socrates. So I have someone that does my shipping for me. We ship out three to four times a week and that's a huge help. Um, and then besides that, I have a studio assistant that I work with that helps keep me organized. And she does an amazing job in terms of, you know, multitasking and just whatever the project is. We work on that together. I also have a few seamstresses and sewers that I work with. And it's also gotten to the point, you know, a whole other part of this is the actual, I guess, production. So I actually recently went through an issue over the summer. I had a factory in the garment district that I had been working with the past four years that was doing my production of my handbags. Uh, and they went out of business. It was so crazy. It was... Wow. Um, I was thinking about placing a new order with them and I had been delaying it for a few weeks. And I didn't quite know why. And I just had this feeling like I need to call them and I need to place this order. So I call and they say, we're closing. We're going out of business. Tomorrow's our last day. We have what? your bolts. Of <laughs> I swear. They say, we have some bolts of your fabric. You need to come tomorrow and pick them up. Otherwise we have to throw everything out. Tomorrow's <laughs> our last day. So I literally, you know, get up seven in the morning, drive to the city, which is about a two hour drive ride and fill up my car with all my fabric, wave goodbye to them. And that was it. Wow. And <laughs> wow. That was so stressful for me because it marked a, a big turning point because I was so excited, you know, to be leveraging the garment district, to be working with the, with the factory mm -hmm. in the garment district to say locally made, made New York. But at that moment, you know, it's like, do I find a new factory to work with? And I spent time, you know, I spent a few days after that in the garment district looking for other factories. And what I found out was the reason that factory closed is that they were severely undercharging me. 
for oh, the production no. they were doing. Why? And I had, How? I had no. I, I honestly had no idea because they were making you know designer clothing and they were putting basically my, doing my production runs in between the designer clothing. And so I thought you know this designer clothing is so complicated. Uh huh. My pieces because I I make all my samples myself. I still make my samples myself. So I looked at. I'm like this must not be very. They must have some machine or some process that this is not that complicated for them. And all the other factories I went to after that in the garment district, you know, were quoting me four to four to six times as much as what this other factory had been charging me. And it became, you know what? This isn't sustainable anymore for me to do production in the garment district. It got to that point. So after that, I moved everything to my studio in Socrates in the Catskills. And I have a team in place that I've been training since the summer on doing my production in-house in Socrates. Wow. Which yeah, that's been a huge change. And that's like, again, another hat to wear because before it used to be, okay, here's the the sample. Here's the the top of production is if, um, is approved. And now I'll just be in touch in, you know, two, three weeks and it'll be ready. I'll come pick it up or you'll ship it to me. Now it's literally I'm working with the team and we're doing the production in my studio. Wow. That is, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's funny. I've been like hearing this story more and more often lately a few of my clients, like their domestic factories have been closing too. And it's just like, what are we going to do? I, I, I think like, I felt like we were making a lot of progress with like, and when I say we, I mean, like the collective we, not like mm-hmm. you and me. Um, I thought we were making a lot of progress with more and more production coming back to the United States, but it seems like in the past like year or so, it's actually moving the other direction again, which is very concerning to me. Yeah, I mean, it's getting to the point, even sometimes I talk to, you know, makers or factories, you know, within the area, and they say, yeah, this has to, you have to do this overseas to hit this price point. And it's, it's, it's challenging, because, you know, from, from, I guess, my point of view, or just if you're doing the math, you know, $15 an hour in New York at this point is the minimum wage, right? Mm -hmm. If you're hiring a factory, to sew something for you or make something for you, they're doubling that. You know, they they want to make profit off of that. So they have to pay their worker 15 an hour. And then on top of that, in theory, they have to also make $15 an hour for the, themselves. So think about like a dress shirt. There's no way a dress shirt can be made start to finish all the components in an hour, right? Mm-hmm. So then you start to do the math. <laughs> or like my handbags, like, like my handbags, I can make my handbags – you know, depending on what it is, maybe, you know, in two hours. But then you start to say, okay, so I'm making it myself. What would it be if a factory makes it? And then you start to crunch the numbers. You're like, this doesn't make sense anymore at this price point that I was selling it at. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think, you know, we live in this era, which we talk about all the time here on Close Horse, of people, Mm -hmm. you know, we have been very confused about what the price and value of clothing and bags and shoes and everything we buy is um, yeah. because we have, I mean, the reality is we've been able to buy necklaces for $2 and 90 cents and dresses for 20 bucks because people weren't getting paid a living wage. Right. And we're working mm-hmm. under terrible conditions and there's no way you can get a brand new necklace for two bucks or a dress for $20 without something like that happening, right? Without that being a part of it. And then of course, also the quality being another element of it. And I think we just have to have like a really, really hard conversation with ourselves about like how much stuff do we need? We probably don't need as much as we think we do. In fact, it's not probably, it's for sure. We don't, it was interesting. I was uh, doing an interview, like I was being interviewed by someone who lives in the UK for their uh, graduate school project. And they were telling me, they were like, yeah, you know, do you ever feel kind of like upset because you'll have a friend who says, oh, all I can afford is Shein, but then you see them place like a $300 order and you wonder like, couldn't they just have bought a couple of nice things for $300 rather than like a haul for $300? And I'm like, Mm -hmm. dude, this is me like every day. I'm spiraling about this every day. (laughs) Like it's definitely on my mind. How do we... How do we dismantle this like more is better that we've all been, I don't know, we've been like infected with it, you know, like we need to move away from that and and know that we want nice things that will last a long time that are made ethically, no one's Mm -hmm. suffering to get it done. And when we do that, we're going to pay more. So maybe we just don't need as many, you know? 
I think I think that's 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 an obstacle that I feel like is facing all of my friends who are small brands because they have to do the labor of trying to convince people of that. Um, and it's also what is keeping places like Shein and Timu just like growing and growing because, well, if I can't get as a gazillion things from you, I'll get it from somewhere else. It's like, it is one of those things that actually like infuriates me, but it also frustrates me because I just, I don't know how we fix it, but it needs to be fixed. I don't know. I don't know. But I'm I'm glad you like broke it out that way because I think it's really important to remember if the if the min- minimum wage is $15, which is should garment work pay more than $15? I think so. I, I think it's actually very skilled labor. Absolutely. It should be yeah. pro- a living a people sewing clothing, bags, making jewelry, all these things. They should be getting a living wage for their work mm-hmm. because it's highly skilled. Well, that means we're not going to get handbags for 30 bucks or 50 bucks or maybe even 100 bucks. And we have to be okay with that because maybe we don't need a whole closet of bags. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's no maybe about it. We don't. You know, it's the same thing with shoes. Gosh, I – early in the pandemic, my husband and I briefly for, I don't know, like three months got really into that show Married at First Sight. And there's like a gazillion seasons, so it was a time killer. And it would inevitably, there's an episode where they, the couples are like going to move in together and they always go to the woman's house and she's got boxes and boxes and boxes of horrible shoes that she's only worn one time. (laughs) And it's this whole thing like, where are we going to put all your shoes and bags? And it's like, yeah, why do you have all those shoes and bags? They're terrible. (laughs) Um, It's the same, it's the same thing. It's like, I think for the world to be more ethical, we have to unpack it within ourselves too. Like we're a part of that equation. I think part of this also, you know, we were talking about the cost of the labor, but we haven't even talked about the cost of the materials for the components, for the fabric, for yeah, yeah, all the different things that are involved. And I know in the past you've said with fast fashion, the least expensive, I forget, say it again. The most expensive part is always the fabric. Um, and so that's the one where we cut the corners the most because it shouldn't be that way. The most expensive thing should not be the fabric. It should be the labor. So that's like messed up anyway. But like we just continue to dilute the fabric until it is like so far from the original um, that that alone like will change what a garment is, you know. And its longevity is like instantly changed. So we would always in meetings start by – cheapening the fabric and sometimes it takes like three or four or five passes i mean i can't even imagine like in a situation where you're making handbags or jewelry where then you have to also start thinking about components like at least with clothing it's like oh we already put the cheapest zipper in don't worry (laughs) i mean i'm laughing but it's sad of course Mm -hmm. yeah the thing with no accessories those components need to perform right that zipper needs to work (laughs) yeah somehow in clothing we're just like oh it broke already oh well (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with us as a species, but <laughs> yeah, but like with accessories, they do. I mean, if you have a bag and the strap breaks, uh, that's bad. <laughs> it's like unusable, right? Exactly. Um, so quality is like really, really important. But like, have you found over the past few years that these individual pieces and, you know, even the materials, have they gone up in price a lot? They have. So all the fabric I use for my accessories, for my handbags, for my sleep masks, uh, for some of my jewelry even, that's all remnant fabric that I source from the garment district. So remnant fabric, what that means, it's it's fabric that's left over from other designers when they do production runs. And that being said, it's not an expensive fabric, you know, it's designer fabric, but the and also the cost has gone up a lot. I'd say at least 25% over the past 2 years. And I buy a lot of things like silk charmeuse, you know, which is that's a very, you know, high-end fine fabric and the cost of that has gone up and it's also becoming more difficult to source these kinds of materials, these high-end materials, because a lot of these designers don't want to want to do it anymore because they know the cost is going up even when they're producing it on their end, when they're doing the production with their mills. That makes sense. Yeah, I didn't even think of that, that they might be like buying a lot less fabric too. Because I mean, like in the like 2010 to 2015 span of my career, maybe even a little bit longer, man, mm-hmm. we were wasting so much fabric, like running so much more that we would ever use. I feel like 
definitely anyone who was working with like that leftover slash dead stock fabric was probably having their pick of the litter back then. But I would guess like since 2020, especially there's a lot less to work with. Yeah, there is. I mean, I see it firsthand when I go to source fabrics, you know, some colors just are not easy to find. And also it becomes once, I mean, the thing with remnant fabric is once it's sold out, that's it. You know, you get limited edition runs basically. And it becomes a challenge, you know, when I have larger orders, especially with wholesalers that they want to order something that I might have, you know, a small quantity of, I have to go figure out, can I source something similar? I can't find the same exact color, but um, something this comes up a lot with actually is I have these heart-shaped sleep masks that I that are very popular usually around Valentine's Day. And it's actually very difficult to find bright red silk charmeuse. Every time a wholesale order comes in for that, it's like, I know it's going to be a challenge. <laughs> it's like, oh, I no. <laughs> yeah, there's not enough red clothing these days anyway. I've just noticed that side note. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I could see, I mean, that is, you know, that is another thing that uh, a lot of people who work outside of this, like, wouldn't be thinking of when you're trying to be as, you know, sustainable and unwasteful as possible. Uh, it kind of is like, it adds a like another layer of sort of like creative and intellectual challenge to figure out what you can get and work with that, mm -hmm. you know, like, it's not as simple as like, oh, I'm going to go into work today and I have a Pantone and I'm going to order, you know, a thousand yards of this fabric and it'll be easy, right? This is like so much more next level because it's not, once again, it goes back to this idea of like, it, you can't just get everything you dream of easily, you know? And it, I, I mean, I can't even imagine how frustrating that can be sometimes. Or frustrating, I mean, stressful, especially if you have an order for it. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, what happens usually if I can't find the fabric, I'll send swatches or other options. I'll say, well, this is, or this, this isn't available, but what about, what about this one? This one's available and I know it's similar. And this is like what you were looking for, like this kind of detail. Like it's like, you're looking for a metallic brocade while this one has a similar finish. Are you okay with this one? And they, they tend to be understanding. I mean, there tends to be usually, you know, some form of, you know, re-educating in a way, because I think a lot of larger companies are not used to this idea that um, things are available only in finite quantity. We can't just do a huge production run of a material because this is what you're ordering, that this is like we have to, you know, be resourceful and try to source something else um, because that's how we operate. We try to operate as sustainably as possible. But I mean, that's like, the ethos of our company that like we're not going to create excess like we're not we're not like another fashion brand we work with what's readily available in terms of you know if we're sourcing fabrics it's like if we can't find a certain fabric then it's not just not meant to be mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's not the same i mean i you know for me like as a buyer i'm accustomed to being able to say like this is exactly what i want color wise mm -hmm. and fabric wise and just get it you know, yeah, it's it. I mean, don't get me wrong. Working in product development and design and production for any of these big brands has its own uh, very unhappy times and uh, challenges. Um, you know, top of mind being that like the product you end up with is never what you envisioned in the beginning. But you never have to say, oh, I'm just going to take what I can get in fabrics or materials like and work around that, like at least you can kind of say what you want there. You're just going to, thanks to the pricing, end up with product that you like hate at the end, you know? Yeah. Which is its own uh, mental, mental challenge. If you're enjoying this episode, then this is a great time to remind you that my work here at Close Horse is made possible by the support of listeners like you, just like NPR, and these great small businesses. Please go give them your support. Blank Cass, or Blanket Coats by Cass, is focused on restoring, renewing, and reviving the history held within vintage and heirloom textiles. By embodying the love, craft, and energy that is original to each vintage textile as I transfer it into a new garment, I hope we can reteach ourselves to care for and mend what we have and make it last. Blank Cass lives on Instagram at blank underscore Cass and a website will be launched soon at blankcass.com.
Located in Whistler, Canada, Velvet Underground is a velvet jungle full of vintage and secondhand clothing, plants, a vegan cafe, and lots of rad products from other small sustainable businesses. Our mission is to create a brand and community dedicated to promoting self-expression, as well as educating and inspiring a more sustainable and conscious lifestyle, both for the people and the planet. Find us on Instagram at shop underscore velvet underground or online at www.shopvelvetunderground.com. St. Evans is a New York City based vintage shop that is dedicated to bringing you those special pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just a store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 10% of all sales are donated to a different charitable organization each month. New vintage is released every Thursday at wearstevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at where underscore st dot evens. That's where St. Evans. Country Feedback is a mom and pop record shop in Tarboro, North Carolina. They specialize in used rock, country, and soul and offer affordable vintage clothing and housewares. Do you have used records you want to sell? Country Feedback wants to buy them. Find us on Instagram at Country Feedback Vintage and Vinyl or head down east and visit our brick and mortar. All are welcome at this inclusive and family-friendly record shop in the country. Republica Unicornia Yarns. Handmade yarn and notions for the color obsessed. Made with love and some swearing in fabulous Atlanta, Georgia by head yarn wench Kathleen. Get ready for rainbows with a side of giving a damn. Republica Unicornia is all about making your own magic using small batch, responsibly sourced, hand-dyed yarns, and thoughtfully made notions. Slow fashion all the way down and discover the joy of creating your very own beautiful hand-knit, crocheted, or woven pieces. Find us on Instagram at Republica underscore Unicornia underscore yarns and at www.republicaunicornia.com. Picnic Wear, a slow fashion brand ethically made by hand from vintage and dead stock materials, most notably vintage towels. Founder Danny has worked in the industry as a fashion designer for over 10 years, but started Picnic Wear in response to her dissatisfaction with the industry's shortcomings. Picnic Wear recently moved to rural North Carolina, where all their sewing and accessories are now designed and cut, but the majority of their sewing is done by skilled garment workers in New York City. Their customers take comfort in knowing that all their sewists are paid well above New York City minimum wage. Picnic Wear offers minimal waste and maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. Cute Little Ruin is an online shop dedicated to providing quality vintage and secondhand clothing, vinyl, and home items in a wide range of styles and price points. If it's ethical and legal, we try to find a home for it. Vintage style with progressive values. Find us on Instagram at Cute Little Ruin. Is there a little bit of Italy in your soul? Are you an enthusiast of pre-loved decor and accessories? Bring vintage Italian style and history into your space with the pewter thimble. We source useful and beautiful things and mend them where needed. We also find gorgeous illustrations and make them print worthy. Tarot cards, tea towels, and hand-picked treasures available to you from the comfort of your own home. Responsibly sourced from across Rome, lovingly renewed by fairly paid artists and artisans, with something for every budget. Discover more at thepewterthimble.com. Deco Denim is a startup based out of San Francisco, and it sells clothing and accessories that are sustainable, gender fluid, size inclusive, and high quality, made to last for years to come. Deco Denim is trying to change the way you think about buying clothes. Founder Sarah Mattis wants to empower people to ask important questions like, where was this made? Was this garment made ethically? Is this fabric made of plastic? Can this garment be upcycled? And if not, can it be recycled? Sign up at decodenim.com to receive $20 off your first purchase. They promise not to spam you and send out no more than three emails a month, with two of them surrounding education or a personal note from the founder. Again, that's decodenim.com. Mm-hmm. 
when we got our conversation started, we talked about like the challenges with like cash flow and terms and wholesale that you were facing back when you were making apparel. Do you still experience that kind of thing with accessories? I do. I do in terms of having some cash flow issues. So we still um, work with large retailers that offer net terms, i.e. net 60. And Mm -hmm. it is for me a challenge in terms of being able to accept these kinds of orders and then also, you know, figure out what I'm doing with my cash flow. Um, I still pay all my production people and my staff up front for the orders. Um, I set reminders on my calendar for when some of these payments are due. That being said, I do have one major retailer that I was working with. We were actually selling on consignment, not uh, net terms, and they've actually never paid me. So they owe me currently around fourteen thousand dollars, and I've been I've been chasing them down now for about five months, and have yet to be paid. That is ridiculous. Yeah, because I, mean, I know who it is, and yeah, I, like, I'm not going to say who it is. <laughs> but yeah. um, for me, you know. That's a lot of money just personally, you know, that I have a team, I pay a staff, I have a mortgage, I have rent for my studio, I have a family. And that money could like, it's not it's not like it doesn't go unnoticed, you know, not not being able to collect that. And it, the amount of energy I've also spent, you know, chasing it down, it's just, it's a waste of time, frankly. It is, it is. And also like, you know, if you, I mean, and I, I don't know anything about your financial situation, but let's say you had t- put that cost of production on your credit card. Mm-hmm. It's just collecting interest right now. So it costs you more money too. And a lot of the makers I know, like they are, they're using credit cards to keep things going, you know? So it, it actually like cuts into your ability and by you, I mean, all small business owners out there, like your ability to grow. Oh, for sure. Uh, and because you're being held back by this. And I, I do like the company that I know uh, di- owes you money. I feel like they're going through something weird right now. <laughs> like, I I don't know. Like, they're maybe starting to close some stores or something. I don't know. Um, but still, it's not okay. You know, they have way more money than you do. So what about like, you know, something I had mentioned before is like when you sell on wholesale and you kind of brought it up to you, you know, mm-hmm. because there's so much like downward pressure kind of on pricing, you know, like generally, basically, you want the price that the whoever, you're, like the whoever you're selling this to from a wholesale end, they're going to be able to sell it for four times that price and it'll make sense, which often means that you have to like really, you have to really revisit cost quite a bit. Do you find that super challenging? Like, have you had to make changes based on that? Yes and no. I mean, for me, the way I've handled it is that there are specific categories or products that I can wholesale, and then there are some that I can't. So, for example, my fine jewelry, the pieces I make that are in, you know, solid 14 karat gold, I can't wholesale that because the amount of markup I need to be able to make money or a profit off of that, it just doesn't make sense for the customer. It becomes too high a price point. It becomes too inflated. And the amount of effort on my end to make that piece is just, you know, again, not worth it at the end of the day. That being said, the pieces I do wholesale, my typical margin is 50% of my retail price. I've been able to be firm on that. And I really do mm-hmm. appreciate that, you know, major retailers that I work with accept that. You know, when I was, when I had my clothing company back in the day, I think it was like a 2.4 markup. So mm, I'm- Clothes I, are vicious. Yeah. <laughs> so I really appreciate that it hasn't been an issue that we can, we can operate on a, you know, a two times markup. So, okay, here's something I want to ask you about, which we talked about a little bit before. Because I have other friends who work in the space of accessories and jewelry, and because I have worked on the other side of it, I- uh, have you been copied by anyone? <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. Um, we have had some of our hair clips copied by major retailers. So I have specifically seen copies of my hair clips at Target and Old Navy. And unfortunately, you know, they are slightly different when, of course, when you see it, it's like 30% or whatever. However, you determine 30% <laughs> enough to, to, say, to say, okay, you can't, uh, or, or you say the, the design is generic enough that we can't prove that they copied it. But I know for a fact, those are my designs because, you know, for example, my hair clips, I draw all those shapes by hand myself. And it's mm-hmm. a, when you, when you draw a shape yourself and then you see it in real life, you recognize that shape. 
Yeah. Well, no doubt. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and I was telling you, we talked about this before, like in my experience, like just in the span of my career, it is the accessories and the jewelry that copied the most egregiously. And sometimes it's, I mean, actually I would just say often the buyers for these retailers have no idea that it's a copy. Now, that doesn't mean that sometimes they aren't a part of it because someone in leadership plopped a photo on their desk and said, copy this. But what I would find, like like the way we would source accessories, uh, especially hair accessories and jewelry, was like, and this is everywhere I've worked, we didn't have a design team for that. You know, so what we would do is we'd go to market, we would go to showrooms, and you go into these showrooms, especially for like all this, like the smaller the item, the more of this there is. Like as of jewelry, it's like exceptional. You'll go into a showroom and they will just have mountains of boards. Some of them are hanging on the wall, but others are just stacked up in corners. And on every board are just like, you know, 50, 100 different things you could buy pinned to them. And you sort of page through them and look at all of them, pull the ones you like, and then they send you pricing, right? Or you ask to make changes. And ostensibly, you as the buyer go in there with the belief that all of these things were designed by that vendor's designer, if that designer even exists is the, is the caveat there. But you assume that's the case. And often, you know, like I, I think specifically of when I was working at Urban Outfitters, like, listen, I have plenty of, of problems with that company and I could talk about that for like six hours straight. But back then we were often getting accused of, of stealing jewelry designs. And actually we literally had no idea because we went to market, the vendor had it pinned on a board. We liked it, we bought it. We It's really hard to look for copies of stuff on the internet, even in the era of of Google Lens, you know, of like Google image search, it's still really hard to find exact, to find out whether or not something is copied or not. Sometimes it's easier than others, but back then we didn't even have that resource. And so we would go back to these vendors like, hey, I thought you designed this. And of course, no one gives you a straight answer, but I think that so much of this egregious copying in the realm of jewelry and small accessories, it happens because retailers, they don't want to spend the money to have designers of their own for it. Like they will for clothing, but they won't for these smaller items. And so what happens is you're at the mercy of these vendors and you have to like hope that they're not dishonest. Like I would be really surprised if even Old Navy had designers for accessories. I would be really, really surprised because we didn't at Urban Outfitters. Interesting. You know, like they don't at Anthropology. They don't want to free people. They buy all the stuff on the market. Like the buyers will develop some stuff and like they'll see stuff in showrooms. But I think I think that's why the copies happen so egregiously. And I do think the disinterest in hiring designers to create this stuff like in the, on the corporate level is because they want to keep selling us stuff like hair clips and necklaces for really cheap and have them still be profitable. But the moment you have a designer, you have to pay – suddenly it's not as profitable to sell us really cheap things, you know? But, I mean, how did you – how did you feel? Like, because I, I will tell you, every time something like this comes up on the internet, most people show up and are outraged, right? Some people show up and say, well, you should feel really honored <laughs> that your stuff was copied because that means it was good. What are your thoughts on this? How did you feel when you were copied? Well, you know – When I started my brand, I had one piece that went viral right out the gate. It was called Uh the Gemones Agreement, and it was Uh a necklace that had a hand-shaped clasp that was magnetic. And when I designed it, I had a feeling. I'm like, this is something I feel like is going to be very popular, and this could get knocked off. And I was fortunate because when I came out with that product, I copy, I did a, I copy wrote, copy wrote, copyrighted. (laughs) Which one is it? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's copyrighted, even though that sounds okay. wrong. Yeah, so, I don't know. So I was fortunate when I came out with this design, I spent the time to copyright the design. And by doing that, I had that protection. And sure enough, about three years after launching this, I started to see knockoffs of this necklace. So I was seeing them on Amazon. I was seeing them on Etsy. And I actually worked with a law firm and we found with the law firm over 200 sellers across the internet selling a knockoff of this necklace. And not only were they using 
my like doing a knockoff of the product. They were using my images to sell the product. God, that's a classic. I see that so often now. It's like a double whammy of copying. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. And what also was in a way funny about this is that the images they were using to sell the necklace were images that were on some of my other product listings or on social media. And I had never actually thought that that image would be a good image to choose to promote that product. <laughs> I was like, how interesting. They made that choice. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no accounting for, I don't know, taste, strategy, whatever. But that is so – I mean – Honestly, I feel like nine times out of 10, when I encounter a story online, like on social media about an art, like a maker, an artist, a designer being copied, they always steal the photos too. It's like the full package of yeah, copying. And then after, Crazy. so after going through that, something I learned, which I think is helpful for other business owners is when you go through the copywriting process, it's not only important to copyright your design, you can actually also copyright your images too. And that's additional protection. Mm. That being said, the volume of content I create for MLE, for me to be copywriting, you can do it in batches. I forget how many images at, the, at a time you can do it. But for me, that just seems very overwhelming, even though I went through this. But hopefully this is good advice for you know another designer that is worried about this. Um, but going through this whole thing, it was emotionally very difficult when it when I first discovered it because what was happening was as these knockoffs were coming out, even though I hadn't really discovered them yet, like all of them, I saw a direct mm -hmm. correlation with the knockoffs coming out and my product sales of this piece, the gentleman's agreement, decreasing. Like uh. it definitely affected our business. And um, to the point where, you know, what used to be the majority of my sales – for my company became, you know, a very small percentage. And for me, it became, okay, I have to keep innovating. I have to come up with my next best thing. I think, cause I, I mean, I, I obviously like have really strong feelings about this and this like whole culture of dupes, you know, I mean, there are all these Facebook groups where people are searching for dupes of different brands mm -hmm. and inevitably these are like, you know, AliExpress, Timu, Shein knockoffs of things, sometimes even like random places like Hot Topic or you know, other fast fashion brands from the mall will also have dupes of this stuff. And it's like, I can't stop watching these groups because I just need to know. But I also do get upset because there's definitely this feeling on the behalf, on the part of the people who participate in this like dupe culture that it's sort of like a victimless crime. And it's like, actually, you know, I have seen one, people totally not realize who created something in the first place. Like, like artists lose ownership of their work because they start – people start to think, oh, didn't Zara invent that or something? And two, like, yeah, it directly cuts into sales. And it, it it's just so frustrating. I mean, the other thing I often see with these, like, dupe groups is, like, th rather than going and buying, like, one Selkie dress for, like, $350, they'll buy 10 dupes from Shein. So it's also part of this, like, more is more culture you know, of like, mm -hmm. we have to have a lot of stuff, not just one awesome thing. And I just, uh, it frustrates me to no end. It's one of those things like, I have to like stop myself from thinking about it sometimes because I'll just like work myself up into just like a tizzy over it because I'm like, yeah. oh, the repercussions are very real. They're very real, you know? Yeah. I mean, also part of this, I remember before the knockoff started coming out, I would have all the time followers comment on Instagram, where can I get a dupe of this oh, on my feed? Stop. Yeah. And it's just like, I'm seeing this. Hello. <laughs> so rude. Uh, no, I I mean, I see kind of stuff all the time too. Like, come on, guys. Don't, don't do that. It's very hurtful. You know, especially like... I mean, one of the reasons I really love like talking to small business owners like here on Close Horse is that I want everyone out there to understand how much of your whole self, your life you put into this, all this extra thoughtfulness, like, you know, we were talking about like the scraps and things like that. Like this is, this is work worth supporting versus like going out and buying a dupe. I mean, I can't, I've seen people asking designers where they can find a dupe all the time on instagram posts but i still i can't believe it's real that being said <laughs> we had to buy one to see what the quality was and we bought one it was horrible i have to tell you <laughs> i didn't see that coming <laughs> the hand so the funny thing is whoever i guess came out with this knockoff or 
whatever they did. They didn't even, you know, buy an original. They just copied it off of the image. So the hands are all veiny, which, you know, ours are the way ours designs a very feminine, beautiful hand. These are veiny, very Ew, strange, creepy. creepy hands. Um, the magnet quality <laughs> very was very weak. It was nowhere the same. And then it was interesting also to see how they did the chain versus our chain. We spent a lot uh-huh. of time, you know, in terms of like the way our chain is that each link to make sure that where like the beginning and ending of the ring is, is like hidden and theirs was all over the place. So it was just so funny to see a side-by-side comparison of it. Oh my God. Yeah. The veininess. Sorry. I like (laughs) full body cringe right now. That's creepy. Yeah. I mean, often that's the other thing about these dupes. I mean, frequently they're like copied off the photo. So like a lot gets lost in translation, you know? Uh, I I think like what's so funny to me is like, you know, using Shein as an example. Like I remember four or five years ago, people would buy stuff on Shein and it was like a meme format. Like what I thought I was getting and then what I actually got. And you would see the photos and were like, oh yeah, that's what would happen if you stole the photo from a website and tried to remake it without ever actually seeing the item in first place in in real life in the first place like this is this is what you end up with but yet like back then we were laughing about it and now we're like oh whatever it's so what if it's a veiny necklace <laughs> you know <laughs> okay so like you know we're coming down the home stretch here so i just wanted to hear like what you know what's going on now what are you going to do next you know what worries you i feel like a lot of my friends who are small business owners they're really worried right now like what's on your mind yeah well top of mind is thinking about how to grow my brand i think 2023 was a very challenging year for all small businesses um with what's going on with social media with digital marketing and i'm thinking about other ways you know to get exposure. So one thing I'm thinking about is possibly opening a store, Mm -hmm. which I've never had before. I've experimented with pop-ups. I'm thinking about collaborations with other brands, expanding to other categories. I'm Mm -hmm. currently developing a line of wallets using remnant surplus leather in my studio. And just in general, I want to see my pieces be worn out more. I want to see them more in the public. I mean, my dream would be to have a major celebrity wear it. That's I'm manifesting that for 2024. Let's see if that happens. Um, I'm in a really great place right now in terms of my company that I have a wonderful group of women that I work with and to have a solid team behind me. This is the first time, honestly, I feel like I have what I need to grow. And so for me, it's just go time. It's about, you know, just honing in and just whatever I want to develop in terms of these new categories or expand uh, to just go for it. And um, related to that, I think 2021 was such a huge year to support small brands, you know, coming out of the Mm -hmm. pandemic. And I just hope people don't forget about supporting small businesses. With everything that's changed with digital marketing, it's becoming really difficult as a small brand to get that share of voice and grow. And that's forcing us to look into other avenues, other channels uh, to continue to to build up our businesses. Yeah, I think that's a really good call out. Because like, you know, I hear and I read that retail sales for this holiday were bigger than ever. But I see all my small business friends like really, really fretting right now. And I do worry that people have forgotten. And I guess we just have to keep reminding them once again, like, there's a big difference between buying from uh, like, you know, going and buying your hair clips at like Old Navy versus buying them from you. And, you know, it's it's the quality. It's the ethics and fair wages involved. It's the knowing that you're really mindful about your waste and creating the best product. Like there's a big difference. You get so much for your money that's beyond a clip that holds your hair. And I just like, once again, it just comes back to us like, unpacking that within ourselves. All right. Well, do you have any like final words of wisdom or parting thoughts you would like to share with everyone? Well, I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity to come on your podcast and to speak with you about this. Um, You know, sustainability in fashion is something that's very important to me. And it really resonates that you've developed a whole podcast around this. And it really means a lot to me. And it's been so nice to connect with someone who's as passionate about it as I am. So thank you for having me. Well, thank you. I hope that I get to come up to upstate New York and meet you IRL and see what you're all up to up there. I'm planning a trip for sure. Oh, great. (laughs) 
I want to thank Emily for taking the time to talk to me. I hope you all enjoyed getting to know her as much as I did. I hope you all learned a lot of interesting stuff because I did too, especially about nickel and jewelry and stuff. It's pretty cool. I want to give you an update on one thing that Emily mentioned in our convo. And that was, you know, the retailer that owes her money. Um, I want to say it was around $14,000. Well, that company was slash is called Neighborhood Goods. And I guess I say was rather than is because it seems like that business is RIP. It's closed all of its locations. It's deleted all of its social media posts and it pulled down its website. The company owes a lot of money to other brands, all small businesses too. And I have my own thoughts on this situation based on what I've read, based on an offline conversation with Emily um, and some other people who have also been affected by neighborhood goods and its closure. Uh, I think the CEO is handling it all in a very unprofessional and immature manner, and he just needs to like give people their money. I'm also like, to be honest, I'm really nervous that any of these businesses will ever be paid based on what I saw happen when Nasty Gal went bankrupt. Like neighborhood goods hasn't filed for bankruptcy, but they've just sort of closed up business. So I I don't know what's going to happen next. I want to say they had four or five stores. They owe a lot of people money. I will be keeping my eye on this situation and I'll update you with anything I learn. Um, I'm also going to share an article from Inc. from about two days ago that gives the most accurate summary of where the situation is right now. And I wish I could say something to all of you, like, here's this thing you can do to help all these businesses get paid. But honestly, like, since they pulled down all their social media, which I think was an intentional choice, there's no way to even contact them. Um, yeah, it sucks. It's really unfair. Um, that, I mean, many of you probably aren't familiar with neighborhood goods, but I'm gonna tell you there was a situation Last year, they have a they had a huge store on South Congress in Austin, like expensive location, okay? And it was going around on Reddit uh, where some people had gone to the store and it was closed. And the doors, which were glass, were kind of wallpapered with these letters from the landlord saying that they owed $98,000 in back rent. And I want to say that was for one month of rent. Um, and so they were losing, the lease was broken, like they were going to be evicted. $98,000 a month. And I don't know if any of you have ever been into a neighborhood goods store, but I'm just going to tell you, I'd been wondering all along how they exactly made their math math, especially when I learned that their amount was $98,000 because I never saw anyone in there and there was no way they were selling enough product to pay that rent and their workers and everything else. And I just look at a company like that and I'm like, wow, like you're so irresponsible. You are so like not thinking of the community in any way, uh, including the community that is your employees and the brands that work with you. Like y- you, it's like a house of cards, you know? When you sign a bunch of $98,000 leases and expand really fast, probably because you got some VC money, uh, you're already kind of knowing that most likely people are going to be hurt. So yeah, that's my two cents on it. Uh, capitalism is its, at its finest right there, right? Anyway, um, I'm going to share all the places you can find Emily in the show notes, including as at made by MLE on Instagram and at made by MLE.com. And as a special offer for closed horse listeners, if you find yourself needing a gift or a special piece of jewelry that you will wear, hopefully for the rest of your life, you can use code close horse at made by MLE.com to get 10% off your order. This in no way benefits me. It's just something nice that Emily wanted to do. Um, So you can go check that out and that'll all be in the show notes. And yeah, that kind of wraps up this week's episode. I'll be back next week. I'm really excited about next week, next week's episode. I mean, I'm excited about all the episodes. Let's be honest. I'm an excitable person. Um, Next week's episode is all about happiness and overconsumption. I've been thinking about nonstop since recording it. So You'll get to hear that next week. Thanks for listening to another episode of Close Horse. 
written, researched, edited, hosted, all the things by me, Amanda Lee McCarty. You know you can leave a rating, you can leave a review, you can subscribe, that's actually really helpful, you should subscribe. But most importantly, just tell your friends about Close Horse. Let's get them into this community, right? That's the word of the year, community. If you'd like to support my work financially, there are so many places and ways you can do that. You can learn more in the show notes or in my Instagram profile. I get tired of saying all the stuff, so just go check it out there. (laughs) And of course, last but never least, thank you to Dustin Travis White for our music and audio support, and I will see you all next week. Bye. Bye.